Hi, it's Dwyer of DwyerCrime.blog, also always1776.com. Let's talk about the murder of the McStay family. It's right now the centerpiece of an excellent documentary series called Two Shallow Graves. Today is May the 26th, 2022. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me back up a second and let me just discuss my approach, my agenda here at DwyerCrime.blog, right? Or if you're watching on YouTube, Esquire 777. I'm neither pro-prosecution or pro-defense. What I am is pro the burden of proof, right? Whatever the crime, however horrific it is, even when it's completely awful, like this crime, a mass murder, two of the victims under the age of five, I believe we need to insist that the prosecution prove its case for the crime charged beyond a reasonable doubt. Either we have a proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard or we don't. Now, what I want people to do is focus hard on this case. Understand the defendant here, Chase Merritt, is charged with murder in the first degree. Right? The jury convicts him and gives him the death penalty. In other words, the stakes here are as high as can be imagined. Understand how violent it is here. The state is maintaining that the murder weapon was a small sledgehammer. Joseph is 40. The murder is so violent that he has a broken leg, a broken rib, and is hit with this sledgehammer at least, according to the prosecution, four times in the head, at least. His wife, Summer, 43 years old. Gianni, four. Joey Jr., three. Now, I believe, based on the show, based on the prosecution's presentation, and let's be even-handed here, there's going to be a link in the description of this video to the prosecution's opening statement. Not just a book on it. No, the video of the actual opening statement. I encourage viewers to sit down, it's over an hour, and to watch that opening statement. Right, I understand, the crime is horrific, folks. Don't get me wrong. But from this seat, I don't believe the prosecution comes close, comes close to proving that this defendant killed these four people. Let's ask some questions here, right? You've seen the show, Two Shallow Graves, on ID Network. You've heard the evidence. You've heard from countless people. Joseph McStay's father, Joseph McStay's brother, who's the person who climbs through the window, right, to see if his brother's home after his brother and his family have been missing for several days. You've heard from the prosecutor. You've heard from defense counsel, right? No, no doubt you've watched several hours of the documentary series. So, in a case where the defendant was convicted of four murders and was given the death penalty, let me ask some basic questions. Right, just close your eyes for a moment and indulge me. 
You tell me in the comment section of this video whether you think any of these questions are unfair. The first question, where is the murder scene? Put differently, where are these four people killed? Do you know? Second question, when did the murders take place? Understand, the family goes missing on February the 4th, 2010. Their car is discovered in San Ysidro, California on February the 8th, 2010, four days later. You're a member of the jury. When did the murders take place? Let's ask the third question. Where are the forensics? Right, I understand some DNA is found in McStay's vehicle. Okay, fine. Right, not as much DNA as McStay's DNA. Right, but some DNA is found in the vehicle. I don't believe anyone is contending that the family was killed in the vehicle. Some DNA is found in the vehicle. Where is the DNA anywhere else? Right, folks, where are the forensics? People were in the house. You know this was a bloody, awful murder involving a sledgehammer and headshots where there would be a lot of bleeding around the brain. Where are the forensics? Let's ask another question, right? Understanding that the vehicle is left in San Ysidro and gets towed, right? Understanding that the bodies are transported into the high desert area. Understanding that the McStays leave their house and that there is surveillance footage of at least the bottom of the vehicle, allegedly, right? Leaving the house in the evening of February the 4th, 2010. My question is, where are the witnesses to any part of the crime? Does anyone see Chase Merritt at the house on February 4th? Does anyone see Chase Merritt drop off the vehicle in San Ysidro at any time? Does anyone see Chase Merritt in the high desert burying the bodies? Folks, it's in two shallow graves. Someone's out there digging. Finally, let's ask the last question. How could one man pull this off? Right, four people are killed. They're two adults, two adults. Attention is paid to each because each is hit in the head with a sledgehammer multiple times. Understand, too, the timeline that the prosecution has come up with would require Chase Merritt to, on the fly, on February the 4th, to decide, I need to go over there by myself and take action. He doesn't have time to enlist co-conspirators. He doesn't have time to get help. Folks, I just don't see it. Let me point out that if a defendant is charged with murder in the first degree, in my opinion, the prosecution has to prove murder in the first degree, not embezzlement. 
which is a different offense, which doesn't get you the death penalty. I'll concede, there's evidence that Chase Merritt was embezzling from the company. There's a lot of talk by the prosecution in the opening statement, which is in the description section of this YouTube video. There's a lot of talk about QuickBooks accounts and someone putting Chase Merritt's name as a vendor and checks being diverted to Chase Merritt. Okay, great. Convict him of embezzlement. I don't see how you leap from that to murder. Let me point out, too, that Chase Merritt is not the only person who withdraws money from financial accounts controlled by Joseph McStay. Right? Just understand, the embezzlement, that's a separate offense. You can't prove embezzlement and then turn around and say, I'm asking you to convict him of murder with no idea on how the murders were committed, where the murders were committed, with extremely limited forensics, with no eyewitness testimony, with not even an explanation as to how one guy could kill the four people. Now let's talk about some of the facts of the case. The family goes missing on February 4th, 2010, right? That's the last time they're seen. People don't quite come to grips with the fact that they're actually missing for several days. Now, understand the family's 1996 Zuzu Trooper is towed from a strip mall, a strip mall, a commercial establishment in San Ysidro, San Diego on February 8th, 2010. No one at the time realizes that the McStays are missing. Right? Understand, there's no witness who's come forward who has put Chase Merritt in San Ysidro at any time from February 4th, 2010 to February 8th, 2010. Let me also point out, too, that the prosecution's theory of the case, to the extent one exists, has Chase Merritt doing all of these crimes by himself. Right? They didn't pursue a murder-for-hire theory because they have no evidence of a murder-for-hire. This is even in a case where they heavily scrutinized Chase Merritt's finances, as you can see from the opening statement. Now, on February 13th, 2010, nine days after the McStays are last seen, Joe McStay's brother climbs in their window looking for them. No one is home. The dogs are in the backyard. On February 15th, 2010, 11 days after they are last seen, Michael, the brother, calls the cops who come to the house. Now understand, the police at the house find no evidence let me repeat that. No evidence of struggle or foul play. There's a carton of eggs on the counter. There are two child-sized bowls of popcorn near the sofa. On the family's computer were searches for what documents do children need for traveling to Mexico. There are also Spanish language lessons. Now, folks, these murders are so violent. How could there not be blood spatter 
at the house if the murders were committed at the house. How could there not be blood spatter, bleeding, evidence that people have been savagely beaten to death with a sledgehammer in the McStay's trooper? Didn't the McStay's have to leave the house in the trooper? Isn't that implicit? in the prosecution's theory of the case, which is hazy. Think about the logistics, too. Wouldn't Chase Merritt have to travel to the house? Wouldn't he have to drive something to get to the house? Right? You tell me what's going on here. How do the McStays vanish their vehicle vanish. No one come forward to say that they saw Chase Merritt's car at the house because Merritt would have to take the McStay's in the McStay's vehicle if he kills them in the house and then puts them in their vehicle and their vehicle is seen, at least a part of the vehicle, on the surveillance tape from across the street. How come we have no sightings of Merritt's vehicle at the house that night? Let me also say, too, that on the show, and this is very important, on the Two Shallow Graves show, in one of the later episodes, I believe it's the last episode, they have a member of the prosecution team speculate on how the murders could have been committed. The argument is that Chase Merritt shows up and kills the people sequentially. Right? The idea is that he runs into Joseph downstairs. He kills Joseph with the sledgehammer. His wife is upstairs, comes down, sees that her husband's been killed. So Merritt then decides to kill the wife with the sledgehammer. Then, of course, to leave no witnesses, Merritt kills the two kids. Where is the forensic evidence for any of that? At the house. Where is it, folks? If you don't know how the crime was committed, if you don't know where the McStays were bludgeoned to death, if you don't know the circumstances under which the McStays leave the house, then how can anyone be found guilty of their murder? even when there is contemporaneous embezzlement. In my opinion, another theory of the case is that the murders were done by professionals. Understand, there's no extra vehicle seen at the residence. We just don't have the information as to the circumstances under which the McStays leave the house. Nor do we have information as to whether the McStays were murdered in the house. There just isn't the evidence. The prosecution so desperate that in their opening statement, the prosecutor actually points out that a lamp was knocked over at the house. The prosecution further points out that McStay's family, before the search warrant was issued, took some stuff out of the house and cleaned up parts of the house. Right? His brother, for example, takes the family computer out of the house. Right? Think about that. 
the inference is that the house looked clean because the family cleaned it up. Let's use common sense. Do you believe the family would have cleaned up the house if there was blood, brain tissue? Because people are knocked in the head with a sledgehammer. Blood spatter. You think the family would clean up the house? So when the cops looked at the house, the house showed nothing untoward. Let me also point out, too, that the murder weapon is left in the grave with the bodies. Isn't that what a professional would do? Folks, we have no clue on how the McStay's car gets to San Ysidro. Are you sure that Chase Merritt, on his own, is running around this is why he's supposed to be embezzling money. Keep in mind, he has a serious girlfriend. People think she's his wife. He has relationships. He would have to be seriously running around, as you could imagine, to somehow kill the victims, take the car to San Ysidro, take the victims' bodies to the high desert. Right? Unexplained is how he could drive the car to San Ysidro then on his own. And understand, this is the prosecution's theory of the case. He's supposed to have done everything on his own. On his own, found his way back to where he lives so that he could take the bodies to the shallow grave. Or maybe the prosecution wants you to believe he's taken the bodies to the shallow graves in the high desert. Then later, takes the car down to San Ysidro. Nobody sees him with their car. Right, folks, the evidence is lacking. You are supposed to speculate in a death penalty murder case. Let me also make a few other points. Let's talk about the opening statement. Charles Merritt is talking to the police. This is the quality of the evidence. You tell me if this is enough to have him found guilty of murder. Merritt's first conversation with the police. He's talking and he says that Joseph McStay was my best friend. Right now, folks, This is someone who hasn't heard from Joseph for several days, who had more than two dozen phone calls with Joseph on the day they go missing, right? This is a guy who is talking to Joseph on an ongoing basis, Right, the two dozen calls, I think that's the total number of times that Joseph tried to call him and he called Joseph. Right, some of those calls may not have gone through. But understand, this is a guy who worked with Joseph, who had an ongoing relationship with Joseph, and here he hasn't heard from Joseph for several days. So he uses the past tense. He says, Joseph was my best friend. You're going to hang a murder conviction on that? You're going to make the claim that because he uses the past tense during a time of trauma, the guy's missing, that that necessarily implies that he's responsible for the guy missing? You don't start focusing on past tense language unless your case is weak. Right? The opening statement should have been of the kind where they say, this murder weapon belonged to Charles Merritt. Right? We know that from these photos, or Charles Merritt's DNA is found on the murder weapon. Right? Strong evidence would be the car was dropped off in San Ysidro, and here is the security footage of Charles Merritt leaving the car that day. 
if you had evidence like this, or, you know, here are the witnesses who saw Charles Merritt getting out of the Isuzu Trooper, right? Here's a photo, or here are the witnesses who saw Charles Merritt's car at the McStay residence the afternoon that they go missing. If you have that kind of evidence, you're not fixated on evidence like this. He used the past tense. He talked about the children in the past tense. Right, understand the past tense is consistent with him believing that maybe the family left and went to Mexico. Maybe the family left the area. Also, there's talk that Merritt owes Joseph $42,000. Right? Just understand that, okay, that's relevant if you're talking about a motive behind embezzlement. Right? But that's, that's a small part of the case. Debt doesn't equal murder. You need far more than to point out that the guy owed money or that the guy had a gambling problem. You actually need a factual nexus that puts the guy with the murder victims committing the murder. The prosecution also points out that the surveillance tape from across the street shows the bottom of the McStay's car at 7.47 p.m. on February the 4th, 2010. Right? We have the surveillance tape. It shows just a part of the car, the bottom of it, moving away from the McStay's residence. Let's flip this on its head. You mean there's a surveillance tape across the street that presumably shows, right, cars on the street during a period of time. And you mean to tell me that none of this surveillance tape from February the 4th, 2010, shows Chase Merritt's vehicle, right? Folks, you have surveillance on the street. It doesn't show his vehicle. It also doesn't show who's in the McStay vehicle when it leaves at 747. Let me also point out, too, that I want you to see how early, and I mean early, in the prosecution's opening statement in this case, that the prosecutor starts talking about the graves being found three years later. That should be a red flag, shouldn't it? Is that all they have from 2010? You're going to tell me that the murder victim's vehicle was found in San Ysidro, and you're just going to leave that hanging. You're not going to link the defendant to the vehicle. You're not going to tell me where the victims were killed. You're just going to tell me that this defendant had financial problems, that this defendant owed Joseph McStay money, that this defendant may have been embezzling from McStay's business. Okay. Okay. Convict him of embezzlement. Right, convict him of owing his boss money, if you consider that a crime. Let me uh, continue. Now understand, this looks like a professional job to me, right? The people just disappear. They have dogs. The dogs are in the backyard. 
right? There's no sighting of anything untoward at the house to the police when they look at the house. The people leave the residence suddenly at 7.47 p.m. Or so it seems, right? Food's out, they're gone. There's no tussle in the house. Really suggests a team, doesn't it? Doesn't suggest one person. Well, what I want people to consider is the idea that McStay is operating a business, right? He has different people he works with, right? He has a business partner. I'm not saying the business partner, Dan Cavanaugh, did the murder. But just to understand, he has people around him who he's doing transactions with. Some of them believe that they were lied to. That's Dan Cavanaugh, believes he was lied to, right? He's supposed to get a percentage of the commercial transactions, and he contends that some of the commercial transactions were withheld from him. Well, understand you have a painter at the house. Now, I'm mentioning this painter not to imply that the painter did the killing, but just that the painter is an example of the number of people in Joseph McStay's world with whom he's doing deals with. So the house, believe it or not, around the time that the McStays go missing is getting painted. You have a painter at the house on February 2nd, two days before the family goes missing. Right? The painter doesn't finish the job. The prosecution concedes that McStay's wife was livid, was mad. She wanted the job finished. Right? Understand. At the house, stuff was put up when the McStays went missing to protect the painting that had been done. In other words, there's a lot of things in that house that could have left marks on whoever the perpetrator was if any of the killings were done at the house. Now, the painter was supposed to come back on February the 6th. 2010, two days after the McStays go missing, the painter who understood that the wife was upset with him did not hear from the McStays and just assumed that they didn't want him back. Now that implies a way of doing business by the McStays, right? Are we certain, based on this lack of evidence, that the McStays didn't owe someone money, someone other than the painter or their business partner, who might have then decided to take it out on the McStays. Understand, according to reports, the McStays had something like $100,000 in their bank account when they went missing. Now, let me point out, that there are a lot of phone calls, a lot of phone calls between Joseph McStay and Chase Merritt on February the 4th, right? A lot of phone calls. Now, it's true that Chase Merritt may have put himself on Joseph McStay's QuickBooks account just a few days before this, on February the 1st. It's also true that later, Chase Merritt likely called QuickBooks, someone from his cell phone did, and asked that the QuickBooks account be terminated after requesting some changes at first. Okay, fine. That's all consistent with Chase Merritt trying to cover his financial tracks. Does that information equal murder? Does 
those actions, do those actions warrant the death penalty? Isn't that embezzlement, not murder? Let me say, too, that much is made by the prosecutor of the fact that the defendant's phone goes off the grid from 5.32 p.m. to 9.42 p.m. on February the 4th, 2010. Now, the prosecution is hinting that there's a rupture in the business relationship between McStay and Chase Merritt, that the phone calls that took place before 532 were, hey, player, you're embezzling from me, right? I'm cutting you off. That's what the prosecution is speculating. They don't have a single witness to back that up. Right? Joseph McStay doesn't talk about Chase Merritt embezzling from him with his family members. Right? His father knows nothing about any kind of embezzlement. Right? That's made up out of whole cloth because the case is that deficient. Understand, too, the problem with the prosecution theory of the case is it excludes other people. In other words, if I'm to buy the prosecution's version of the case, Chase Merritt hears on the 4th that he's cut off. So then he decides to go over to his friend's place, take his phone off the grid, go over to his friend's place, and murder the family, right? His phone is offline from 5.32 p.m. to 9.42 p.m. Tell me what happened during that time period. If you can't, if the prosecution can't, then I don't have enough to pin the four murders on him. Understand, Merritt has no time to get co-conspirators. This is a situation where two guys in business decide if you believe the speculation, and that's what it is. Two guys in business decide, or at least one of them decides, hey, I'm stopping our business relationship. So then the other guy goes over there and is supposed to do what in these four hours? Bludgeon the four people to death, get them in their car, leave his car there, drive them where? Not to San Ysidro, not to the high desert, because if he's doing this by himself, let's say he bludgeons the four of them to death, he drives out to the high desert, he buries the bodies in two shallow graves, he then drives all the way to San Ysidro, several miles away, right? Then he hitchhikes back or takes a cab back, for which, of course, we have no evidence. Could he do all of that without being seen in a scant four-hour and ten-minute time period? Right, folks, If the prosecution doesn't know how it happened, they can't tell you how it happened. And if you don't know how it happened, how can you find this defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Right? The rest of the presentation, I would argue, in the opening statement is about embezzlement. There's not enough about the murder. You don't know where it took place. You don't know when it took place. You have no idea 
when these shallow graves were built. You have no idea how the McStay's vehicle gets to San Ysidro. None. Let's talk about the DNA in McStay's car. Now understand, there's a lot of DNA on that steering wheel. Right? It's Joseph McStay's DNA. Just food for thought. Now we find out that some of the statements in the prosecution's opening statement are false. They use one swab, folks. One swab. For the DNA, for the radio for other parts of the car, right? The driver's side of the car. One swap. So they don't know with certainty because they only use one swap. Whether Merritt's DNA was on the car radio and then got transferred to the steering wheel because they used the same swap or whether Merritt's DNA is even on the steering wheel. Let me point out something else. Joseph McStay's DNA is on the steering wheel. His wife Summer's DNA is on the steering wheel. According to the prosecution, we'll go with the prosecution's version here. Chase Merritt's DNA is on the steering wheel. Now we know one person's driving. Right, Not all three could be driving at the same time. So the fact that both Joseph McStay's DNA, which is in the largest amount, and his wife's DNA are both on the steering wheel, we understand that the steering wheel retains DNA for a period of time. Right? We don't know whether Summer McStay, the wife, drove the car the week before, the month before, the year before, we don't have that information. So the fact that there is minute DNA that possibly was on the steering wheel doesn't tell me that Chase Merritt drove the car down to San Ysidro or drove the car away from the McStay residence. Right? I don't know that with certainty. There are no eyewitnesses. He could have touched that steering wheel some other time in the past. In other words, we don't have, because of the way the DNA was collected, we don't have a tight time window where we can say Chase Merritt drove this vehicle during this four-hour time period. The DNA result doesn't support that. Let me make a few other points. There's something deeply disturbing in this case. Now, I don't believe Dan Kavanaugh killed the McStays. Right? I don't. But it's very troubling to me that the cops, according to Dan Kavanaugh, Good source. When the cops are talking to Dan Kavanaugh, they tell him he needs to disappear. They tell him Chase Merritt's team might go looking for him. That they've cleared him and that they think he should get lost. The cops tell him that. Now what's the goal here? is the prosecution's goal to get at the truth, to allow the defendant to interview key witnesses like Dan Kavanaugh. When I say witness, I use the word loosely, just witnesses to the operation of McStay's business, not any murder. Or is the goal for the prosecution to get a conviction, to have witnesses disappear, so they are unavailable to the defendant's attorneys, right? Let me also point out, too, that Kavanaugh is interesting because Kavanaugh felt he was owed money. 
Does that suggest that Joseph McStay may have been the kind of guy who was a sharp elbows type of businessman who may have had some disgruntled people he did business with, who may have thought that they were owed money. Understand, this guy was promised 50%. 50 percent, 50 of the business. This guy claims that McStay, after initially trying to rough him up, you know,